right, friends, we're going to give you a few, a few announcements here, and then read God's scripture, and then we'll pray, and then we'll jump into today's message. Just as a caveat for today's message, we're still, we're going to stick with the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to write it through. Um, I believe God's Word is sufficient, and we can apply it in many ways. I can't believe that the total cases, at least on the computer, is nearing 700,000. It probably is way over that because not everyone's been tested. Not everyone is putting the numbers up there and exceeding 31 deaths. So there's lots of people grieving and hurting at this time. But good morning. It's good to see you and engage with you all. I believe God is working in many of us and has us thinking about Him and His Word uh, more now than ever. And God is literally shaking our spiritual foundations. I think, in one sense, preparing the soil to receive His Word. <clears throat> I had another thought, but I can't remember it now. But it's okay. It's good to see you. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead. And I just want to give you a few announcements. Uh, we still have growth, growth groups going on at Rooted Church. This is a great opportunity to be in fellowship with one another, to continue to study God's Word with one another. Um, we're going through basic doctrine, laying down a foundation for, for Rooted Church and for whoever else who wants to join in. And if you want information on that, feel free to comment or to email Dylan Frazier. We're also initiating discipleship groups. Uh, we want to disciple our people well, and particularly in the area of spiritual formation. So if you're interested in that, please comment too, and also you could email me um, if you like in that area. And then some people have been asking about the retreat in May 22nd to 25th. Even our speaker was wondering if we're going to still put this on. And my answer is, I don't know, and only God knows. <clears throat> so, I just want to to um, ask you to continue to pray about this, and we will let you know um, as we find out information and we continue to track along with what is going on with the whole COVID-19 process. So, we hope to do it. If it doesn't happen, we will delay it, and we'll delay it, but we definitely want to connect this summer, Lord willing. If not, maybe it's the fall, maybe it's the winter. <clears throat> we don't know how long this is going to go, but as the Lord wills. And one last announcement, really it's not an announcement, I just want to thank you guys for continuing to um, invest and to give um, eternally and give to the Lord's work. And so I just want to remind you, probably the best way to give these days is online through our, our One Church app and one church, one church software. You can find that on the website and also, I believe, on our comment section right now. So I just want to thank you. As the Lord is faithful to you, continue to be faithful to Him as you respond to Him and worship through giving. As a church, we have not uh, been kicked out of our building. Um, <clears throat> the church is really not a building. We're a people, and we're a people on mission. We're a people who follow Christ wherever we go. And so that's our hope there, that we would continue to meet and not check out with God or with each other, that we would really actually be checking in all the more and reaching out all the more. So let's read today's scripture. If you have your Bibles, this, I want you to use your Bibles. I want God's word to run through your eyes, into your minds, and into your heart with the power of the Holy Spirit. So today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. It says here, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Let's pray together. In this time, in this season... What stands out to me is that, Lord God, you are our shepherd. And so, 
we say this um, in faith and conviction. Lord, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Lord, we need this goodness. And we need your mercy. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, you are an amazing shepherd. You are the best shepherd of all. May you refresh our minds and hearts with this truth and the reality of who you are and what you're like. We're so glad that you're with us in this, in this valley. May we not fear, but may we activate faith. May we look to you the author and perfecter of our faith. God, we need your comfort as we experience worry and anxiety and fear. Lord, please comfort us. We want to think beyond us. We pray, thinking about the whole world, your church universal. And so we pray that your mercy, Lord, would go forth and that many would receive salvation through Christ alone, by faith alone, that those who are experienced suffering, Lord, that they would understand your grace and mercy. Those who are sick and grieving, Lord, that they would know your comfort and healing. Father, we pray also for everyone's attitude, Lord, that you would grant us an attitude of gratitude. Lord, that you would help us to have a spirit of cooperation with your spirit and also with the national government that you'd have, help us to cooperate, that we would indeed stay in, that we would ex practice social distancing. Lord, that this virus would slow down, that we could do what we can do on our side of the equation, and we trust you to slow it down by, on your side of the equation of life. Father, we also pray for families who, who have lost loved ones or friends who have lost loved ones. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would be their comfort and peace. Lord, that you would minister to their soul. Lord, that you would allow for more gospel opportunities, more doors to be opened for your gospel to be preached. We don't know fully what you're doing, but we know you're doing something, and we don't want to waste this coronavirus that has struck our lives in profound ways. God, we pray, Lord, for the social economic challenges that we face. Help us that we... Have you, help us remind us that you have, we have you as our great provider. And help us to continue to serve you. And also know, knowing that you care for us more than the lilies of the fields and the birds of the air. Also we pray for Christians that we would rise up, that we would stand up in the gap of prayer and in the gap for other people. For your glory and for the good of others. And Father, I lift up Rooted Church. Rooted Church, I want you to remind you that you are loved uh, more than you realize in the gospel. And that is there for you, whatever you may be experiencing. May I exhort you to continue to, to enjoy Him, to be equipped through His Word, through growth group and discipleship, and through personal training. And also to, to continue to be engaged with one another, with this community, with our co-workers, with our neighbors. So we ask them, how can we pray for you? How can we serve you? God, to this end, we pray and we look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we open up, I'm going to get a little bit of water. It's good. For the body, um, as we go through this, I, we're going to look at a number of scriptures, and as we look at these two verses, the reason I want to look at a number of scriptures is because I want God to speak, 
and God's word is the best commentary for his word. And so most of the illustrations will come straight from God's word, so you could just understand this passage better. Like most of us this day, we are experiencing a lot of stress, anxiety, changes into our rhythm of life. I don't know if you know of anyone personally or maybe through a second or third degree relationship who is sick with the coronavirus at this point or is it may even have passed away. Uh, feel free to share those thoughts, um, share those prayer requests as this is coming closer to each one of us and, and hitting home in a more personal way. Um, I think our minds are wrapped up around death a lot. So I did a little research just wanting to just get an idea of what kind of pandemics our, our world has experienced in the past. And the biggest one, the number one one, happened in 1346 through 1353. It was known as the Black Death. The death toll is, was somewhere between 75 to 200 million. That's a broad range, I know. But I get the idea is way beyond what they could count or calculate. The number two was known as the Spanish flu or the flu epidemic in 1918, maybe 1917, 1920. 20 to 25 million died of the, <clears throat> of the basic flu. Um, and then the third one surprised me. I didn't realize this, but most of us are familiar with HIV and AIDS. But this is considered um, a, pa a pandemic too, which hit its peak between 2005 and 2012, where about 36 to 37 million have passed away due to HIV and AIDS. And so it got me thinking about <clears throat> more basic questions. How many people die in the world each day? The statistics say about 58 million people die each year. I don't know if I said day. I meant each year the first time. But each day, about 150,000 people die. Every minute, actually every, yeah, every minute, 105 people pass away. And every second, about one and three-fourth people pass away. Almost two people. So dying is common. Every one of us will die one, at some point. Even the Bible declares that if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And even Hebrews says that everyone is appointed to die and to be judged one day. We all have a, a lifespan. Some of us have a very short lifespan, span, maybe, you know, a month, a day, a year. Others of us have a longer lifespan, 30 years, 50 years, 80 years, 100 years. We don't know what our lifespan, but I know God has foreordained the day we'll be born and the day we will pass away. I also wanted to stop and give a quick shout out to Jenny and Haji, who had their first baby yesterday, yesterday, I believe, or two days ago. My brain is foggy, but congratulations to Jenny and Haji and baby, baby Caleb. Uh, we love you. We're thinking of you. We can't meet to meet uh, Caleb in person soon. But I do want you to know the lifespan that the Lord has given us is a window of opportunity. And this window opportunity is the, opportunity, the biggest decision in our life, the most important decision in our life. More important than who you might date, or what you might eat, or what school you might go to, or job you might take, or who you might marry one day. You have an opportunity to follow Christ and to choose Christ. And that's this window of opportunity that we call the lifespan in which we find ourselves in today. And so today's message is entitled two ways to live and only one of the two ways leads to heaven and the question i want to ask you and whoever is listening and those who you care about are you on the right way are you on the right path i want you to be sure of this this is important i don't want you to think oh yeah I'm pretty sure. I want you to know for sure and without a doubt. I want you to be able to discern this because there's a lot of false beliefs and axioms that are out there. A couple of them sound like this. Aren't all religions the same? Meaning like it doesn't matter what you believe. 
because you'll end up in the same place. And that begs another statement that we hear every now and then. Some people say, hey, don't we all end up in the same place? And if you read your Bible, you'll find out, if you track along today, you'll find out we won't all end up in the same place. And if you look at even the, the readings and the writing of other religions, you also recognize that they're not all the same. They're actually drastically different if you would read their first-hand literature. So, this morning we're looking at the best sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to hear from the best preacher, Jesus Christ himself, with the, the best illustration. And we're going to hear how he is driving to the end of the sermon. He's driving for a verdict, a decision, a conclusion, an application. And so, that's where we are with the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> I just want to give you a key, couple broad strokes as we summarize where we've been with the Sermon on the Mount up to this place. I understand the Sermon on the Mount is not so much about how do we stay in God's kingdom. It's more of a description of the character and the context conduct of those who belong in God's kingdom. It's not ser this is not really a picture of how to repent, but it may include repenting for those on this road and saying, hey, I'm not on the right road and may want to repent. But really, this is driving after what genuine salvation looks like. It describes really God's work in our lives. It describes what it looks like to live gospel-centered lives. It describes what it means to be a citizen to King Jesus in His kingdom here and now as He rules and reigns in our heart. And lastly, I believe Jesus is addressing not so much doing, but being who He wants us to be in Christ. And as we are becoming who He wants us to be, from there will flow out righteous living and the doing that He calls us to participate in. So this morning we're going to look at four contrasts, four distinctions from this passage, Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14, as we talk about two ways to live at the crossroads of life. So we're going to look at two gates, the narrow and the wide. We're going to look at two ways, the narrow and the broad. We're going to look at two destinations, one of life and one of destruction. And then we're going to look at two crowds, the few and the many. And we're going to look at this so that we would know how to discern where we are at personally with the Lord. And as you do that, you can think about others humbly and graciously where they are at in their journey of life. And the hope at the end that we would look at the cross and the crossroads of life and continue to follow Jesus Christ. So let's begin. We're going to look at the two gates the narrow and the wide. If you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, at the very beginning, it says, Enter by the narrow gate. Okay? So Jesus Christ, He's very kind, He's very gracious. He literally tells us which gate to enter in. He says to enter the narrow gate. He doesn't tell us to go the wrong way or the foolish way, but He tells us to enter the narrow gate. Jesus, as he is speaking here, the word enter is in the aorist imperative tense. He wants us to respond to him right now. And he has a definite purpose for us. He wants us to respond. He's not giving us ideas or suggestions or words to merely admire. He wants us to enter into the narrow gate. He's not saying some gate or the gates that look nice. But he wants us to enter the narrow gate. As we enter into the gate, or maybe even the gate as we enter into life, we're going to enter into one gate or another. It either be the narrow gate or the other gate. It's unavoidable. We will be going through one gate. Let's define what this narrow gate looks like. The narrow gate, we get a clue, an idea from John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. He's not saying, I'm a door, but he describes himself as a door, as a means to go from one place to another. In this case, Jesus is saying, I am the door. If you enter, you see the same word, if you enter by me, 
he will be saved. So Jesus is saying, hey, I function like a door. And if you want to be saved, you enter by Jesus, by Jesus Christ alone. He is the only way in which you can be saved. Okay? He's not talking about other doors or other gays or other faiths or other religions to be saved or forgiven. He's talking about he himself as the only door. I know to, to say that Jesus is the only way sounds like narrow-minded or not thoughtful to others. Um, and I know we live in a world that is into relativistic thinking or is intolerant of other views. I, th I find this funny because really only Christianity gets this kind of pushback where people kick and scream and say Christians are narrow-minded and they're all full of themselves. We're simply trying to say, hey, this is what Jesus said. He made the world. He made how things work. And he says there's one way. In, in, in engineering and in math and other fields, they work in specific concepts of absolutes. This is the absolute truth that Jesus is the only way. No, no one's fussing that we believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2. No one's saying, no, nah, it's not 1. We're not, <laughs> it, it, or it's not 2. Or it is 1. No, 1 plus 1 is an absolute concept that equals 2. But people want to say, ah, it's 1, it's 3, it's 5. No, we're not saying that. It's an absolute truth. But we live in an age of relativism and <clears throat> where we want to not own to absolute truth so people can just believe whatever they want to believe because they feel like this is what I want to believe. We're not talking about a feeling. We're talking about objective truth from God's word. In this case, Jesus declares that he is the door. And if you want to enter, you have to go by him and through him, through his finished work on the cross, through placing and trusting your faith in him and him alone. Okay? So the functional way that this looks like, I don't know if you've gone to an airport and gone on plane rides or maybe a train ride, but a lot of times you go through one at a time, through a turn style. And coming to Christ is a one at a time experience. You don't go in groups, you don't go by family, you don't go by whole churches. You go to Christ by one person at a time. I want to make this a, a big deal because some people say, hey, I grew up in a Christian family, therefore I'm saying my mom and my dad were involved, they served, whatnot. They go, that makes me a Christian. Or maybe they say, hey, I grew up in the church, that's all I ever knew, went to VBS, went to camp, and I go, that makes me a Christian. No, it doesn't make you a Christian. The only way that you become a Christian is if you choose to follow Christ. You repent and believe in Him alone and you're adopted by His sovereign grace. It doesn't happen as a family unit. All right? And as you go through this gate, you do so not clinging on to your garbage, to your own personal righteousness and your merit and your agenda. You come to Christ on His terms. What does it look like to come to Christ on His terms? If you look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25, I'll give you a chance to flip your fingers and get to that in your passage and in your Bibles or on your app. But I want you to see God's Word here. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 25. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come to me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Let me stop right there. Jesus is saying, hey, this is a way of salvation. This is the way of true discipleship. It, it can apply, I believe, for both type of people. And when you come to him, you must disown yourself. It's literally to not count yourself, to abandon yourself, to take up one's cross, being willing to die for the sake of the cross. And as you do that, for the sake of Christ and the gospel, as you do that, you, you're saying, hey, I'm going to follow me or follow Christ. I'm going to be obedient to Scripture. And then Jesus makes this cost really clear of what it means to follow him. He says here, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is basically saying, if you want to find life, in one sense, you lose it now 
all the pleasures of this world and then you'll gain it forever in the life to come. Or you could go this course. I'm going to pursue all the things of this world and gain what this world has to offer and then forfeit everything in the life to come. In verse 6, he kind of nails this basic idea. For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for a soul? So Jesus begs this, the big money question. What does it profit a man if you gain the whole world? You get this amazing $2 trillion stimulus package and it happened to all come to you in the mail. And you invest in, you buy all these companies, you buy all the companies out in the world and you buy the whole earth. You own the whole world. But what does it profit it, you if you gain the whole world yet forfeit your very soul? Through this narrow way, through this narrow gate, you must let go of the baggage of your sin and repent and turn to Jesus in faith. That is the way of the narrow gate. The wide gate, on the other hand, there are no demands. You don't need to repent. It's big enough to accommodate all, all your baggage, all your stuff. All the stuff of this fallen world in which we live in. So question for you, as you look and reflect in your life, have you entered into the narrow gate or have you entered in the wide gate? That brings us to the second contrast, the two ways, the narrow way and the broad way. So the two gates lead to the two ways. It makes sense there. So turn your attention back to Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. Here Jesus says again, The way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. Verse 14, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So let's begin with the narrow gate once again. What does it mean? For <clears throat> What does the narrow gate mean? What is narrow as it co compares to the broad way? The word narrow, narrow in Greek is the Greek word stenos. It comes from the root word of being under pressure or is figurative, figurative, figuratively used to represent restriction or being constricted. It comes from our English word stenography, which talks about writing that is abbreviated or compressed. So as you think about this word narrow, it's that which is compressed. It is a tight way. It's a narrow way. The broad way, on a, on, in contrast, or the opposite, is, is an easy way. It's not hard. There's no resistance. It's broad. It's accommodating. And so, as you look at the narrow way and the broad way, the difference is the fact that it's narrow and broad. But there's a description tied to both of them. One is easy and one is hard. The narrow way is hard and the broad way is easy. Um, I've been reading a number of articles and I'm sure you guys have too. But as we look at the fact that the narrow way is hard, uh, many articles are asking, hey, what is God teaching to us in this season? And many of them are saying, hey, God is teaching us to live by faith. God is teaching us to understand this hard way. That it is difficult. It is painful. It involves suffering. It involves teaching us endurance. And so I believe that are, those are some of the things that God is teaching us now. To, to continue to be faithful. Faith, being faithful is hard. It is difficult. No one said the Christian life is going to be easy. That's the way of what? The broad way. When you think it's going to be easy, you expect it to be easy. Let's contrast these ways a little bit more so you get an idea. The narrow way is difficult, compressed, and uncomfortable, but leads to life, leads to fullness. The broad way appears to be better. So as you think about this, no, <clears throat> the broad way never says, hey, this is the worst way. It says and advertises and presents, presents itself as the better way because it is a life of ease. 
but it turns out that it will lead to destruction, decay, and death, as we'll see very soon. The narrow way is the way of discipleship. The wide way is traveled by those who reject God and His Word. The narrow way, these are people who follow God, the God of the Bible, the triune God. The wide way are those who are disinterested in the God of the Bible. They don't care about Him. They're not interested in Him. They don't want to really know much about Him, less follow Him. I want you to understand more and more that there is one way to Jesus Christ. And over multiple times in Scripture, this is presented. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, except through Christ. So again, Jesus says, I am the way. Earlier we saw that he was the door. In this case, we see that he is the way. There's no other way except for three, Jesus Christ. There's no other way to the Father except to Jesus Christ. Let me just kind of explain a little bit more in terms of what's being said. The Father is in heaven. Our Father is holy and perfect. No one could go to heaven unless they're perfect and holy just like Him. And Jesus is literally saying that no one could come to the Father except through me. And what Jesus is saying, that He is the way. And He if we understand scripture, Jesus Christ is the righteous one. He is the holy one. And he's saying, hey, by faith in Jesus Christ, God is willing, Jesus is willing to give you and grant to, grant to your spiritual account, your spiritual le ledger, his righteousness, his holiness, that you might be fit and you might be right, be made right with God so that you may be fit for heaven. This is the only way to the Father. The Apostle Paul says the basic, same basic thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He says this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one way to the Father, and it's a narrow way. Okay? In the narrow way, we get an idea of what that looked like at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a person whose heart attitude reflects that of the gospel working in and through them. They come to recognize that they are poor in spirit. They're bankrupt spiritually. They come to a point where they recognize they have no righteousness of their own that can impress or increase their status with God. So they hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because of their spiritual situation and the lack of righteousness, they're broken and they're meek. And then we see a point where the gospel comes in play and they become people who are merciful. They're pure in heart. And they care about making peace with others. Maybe the contrast to that reality, if you are on the broad way, you don't care about peace. You, you want to cause harm to others. Your heart isn't pure. You're not merciful. You just want to bring condemnation all the time. And so, the way of the Broadways in stark contrast. These are people who are religious and moral and self-righteous like the scribes and the Pharisees who had to go the wide way even though they thought they were on the narrow way because they had strict views. But they are actually on the wide ways to accommodate their broad practices and views that were contrary to Scripture. In Psalm chapter 1 verses 1 to 4, the psalmist here gives a contrast of godly living versus ungodly living. The wise way versus the wicked way. So if you know Psalm 1, it's great if it's in your mind and head. If you don't know it, please turn with me to Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And you'll get an idea of what it means to live a godly life or an ungodly life from this passage. The psalmist says, blessed, in the, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So the blessed man doesn't go down the path or the way of the wicked one. It's a progression here where you, you hear the counsel, 
and then you end up standing and then you end up sitting in front of their bad unbiblical teaching when you come to the point of sitting literally you're sitting under it this is what you're, you're taking in this is what you are putting your time and energy to some of us may spend hours upon hours listening to lies and falsehood others may even pay to go conferences and listening to lies and falsehood and that's one way of life some people do this all the time but the blessed man it says here but his delight is in the law of the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night he thinks about God's Word he ponders God's Word over and over there's a cultural illustration of what it means to meditate I once read this cultural understanding. It's, it's a picture of a cow who eats grass and he chews, the cow chews on the grass over and over and over and over and over and over. And then what the cow does, the cow swallows the grass. <laughs> and then after a while, the cow says, I'm going to burp it back up and chew on it some more. And then swallows, on, swallows it and then burps it up. And then swallows it and then burps it back up. This is the idea of taking God's word and, and meditating on it <coughs> over and over. You just kind of flip it over and over instead of your mouth and your mind over and over thinking about God's word. And then the psalmist says that he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruits in its season and its leaves does not wither. God is testing and revealing our fruit in the season. And you may find out that you have good fruit or bad fruit. I realize I have some good fruit and I have more bad fruit than I realize. So it's humbling to understand, hey, there's an area of, of growth and yielding to God's word and the spirit that I need in my life. And it goes on and says, all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Toward the end of this sermon, we'll talk about this chaff a little bit more. But I want you guys and gals to clearly see that there are two ways to live. A narrow way and a broad way. Tim Keller contrasts these two ways in, a, in his sermon as he comments on Jesus' sermon. He says this, The sermon, referring to the Sermon on the Mount, contrasts the righteousness of the Pharisees with the righteousness found in Christ. This means the broad way is not traveled by the irreligious, but the religious serve for themselves. They live in pride and seek to justify themselves with their good deeds. In contrast, the narrow way is for those who rely upon God's grace as a means for justification and respond with the, with the discipleship of gratitude. I thought this is so insightful that Jesus, I mean, that Tim Keller recognizes those who are on the Broadway are typically those who are seeking and looking for their own righteousness and, and serving literally themselves. This is a way of what we call of human achievement. We don't need human achievement to make it to the promised land. We need... Jesus Christ, who is the way, who came down for us as divine, accomplish, ac divine accomplishment for us. So the two gates and the two ways end up in two future destinations. And so we're going to look at that now. Two destinations found again, once again, in Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. Jesus describes these two destinations. He says the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few so there are two future destinations one that leads to destruction and the other that leads to life so as I said earlier just as like the the two ways the two Directions that ultimately say, hey, right before you go into the, the, the destruction or the life. On the outside, it simply says, hey, 
You are entering the promised land. You are entering into heaven. Both of them read like this is a good life. This is what life is all about. This is the way of salvation and hope. But one will end up in heaven and the other will end up in hell. And so I want to describe what these two future realities look like using the scripture. So in short, our final destination will be one of two places. It will be either the smoking or the non-smoking section of eternity. It will either be in heaven or it will be in hell. Going back to Psalm chapter 1 verses 5 through 6, it says here, The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Let's read that again. The wicked will not pass judgment. They will actually be judged and sent to hell. Sinners will not be in the congregation of the righteous. What is that? The congregation of the righteous is really heaven. Only the righteous people are there. The wicked and the sinful will not be there. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the wicked will perish. It clearly says the wicked will perish. So there's only two ways to live. We will all die, we'll all be judged, and we'll all live in one of two future destinations. So I want to describe first the destination of life and then the destination of destruction. Let's, be, let's start with the encouraging part first. Most of you are familiar with John 3.16. At the very end of John 3.16, we see what this life is about. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. One thing we know about this future life, this future destination, is referred to as eternal life. Life forever in heaven with God the Father. No. <clears throat> another one, another picture we get that's very descript descriptive is found in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. I love this picture, passage. It's a great picture of what heaven is like. And it shows us how much our, our God loves us. He says this in John chapter 14, verse 1. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. He, Jesus is speaking to people who have troubled hearts. I'm sure we are, to some degree, have troubled hearts these days. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. He doesn't say believe in yourself or believe in me. He says believe in God. And then he says also believe in me, not yourself, but believing in Jesus Christ himself. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to a place, uh, excuse me, that I go to prepare a place for you? So Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to, going to prepare a place for you. We'll explain a little bit more what that looks like. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So what's happening here? Jesus is drawing from a cultural understanding of when a husband is engaged to be married to his wife. In the Jewish culture, that family would start building an extra room to expand their household for this new couple to start the marriage and to have babies. And Jesus is saying, what the Father does, He has many rooms. And He's building many rooms for His adopted children. And Jesus is saying that He is the groom and He is going to prepare and do His part to make many rooms for His children. Or in this case, in the, in the picture of the illustration, for His bride to come back for us his bride, his church, and bring us to heaven one day. And so the, he'll come and return for us and take us there. So this is a beautiful picture of the Lord preparing and expanding his house for us. And he's saying, hey, I got you, and I'll come back and get you. And know that there's a place for 
you one day. And so we could <clears throat> relate to that. God is building a big, big house that has lots and lots of rooms. And I just think that's so cool that our future destination, the future destination of those who have gone through the narrow gate and the narrow way, will one day have a house, the Father's house, with many, many rooms. Another picture of what this life will be like is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 to 5. So this is from the Apostle Paul, I mean, Apostle John. He's on the island of Patmos, and he has this vision into the future. And he's still speaking in these vision type of terms. In, John, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 to 5, he says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In this vision, John is able to hear. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. My friends, this is hard to relate to because we're so used to this fallen world where there is pain, and there's suffering, and there's, there's crying, and there's mourning, and there's loss. There's things that grieve us and we cry, we cry over. In heaven, in this new Jerusalem, this will be no more. They'll be all gone in this new world. This is a picture of what heaven will be like. We will be able to dwell with God. We will have new bodies. We won't have bodies that are susceptible to disease and sickness and viruses and simple decay as our body continues to, to wear out. We'll have new bodies. We'll be dwelling with God in perfect harmony and fellowship. And I know in heaven there will be tables because God is preparing banqueting tables for us that we might feast one day. And I look forward to that. And we think of all our favorite restaurants in this world. They, they won't compare to your favorite restaurant, whatever that may be. It will be a whole novel, another level of feasting together. And when I talk about this, it makes me hungry. I want lunch. But even more... May we desire heaven. May we long to come home one day when God appoints that. So that's our future destination of life, eternal life in heaven forever. The future <coughs> destination for those that went through the gate that is wide and the broad way will lead to destruction. I want you to listen really carefully here. Destruction does not refer to extinction. It does not refer to annihilation, but talks about total ruin and, and loss. It's not complete and total loss of being, because why? We have a soul that will last forever. So we <clears throat> will experience things in the life to come, because we have a soul that will last forever. The destination of those who find themselves in destruction and hell are those who lived a life of human achievement, of their own self-righteousness, their own religion, will find themselves in hell, in lasting torment forever. Okay, We don't need to be ashamed of hell because the concept of hell is found all throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New. So hell is biblical. And people need to know about this. Why? It's Jesus' kindness to warn people, if you head this direction you may end up in hell. If you knew someone that was going to be hit by a car, you would warn them. If you knew someone that was going to fall down a big hole, we would warn them. If we knew, if we knew someone was going to be dropped into a pit of fire, we would say something, I hope. If we had any sense of morality and, and dignity and, and consciousness, we would warn other people about hell. So what is hell? What does it look like? 
I'm going to try to describe hell for you right now. Matthew chapter 3 verse 12. So this is a few chapters before the Sermon on the Mount. It says here, His will winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clearly and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. This is a context of John the Baptist and those who don't repent. He, he says here, but the chaff, we talked about chaff in Psalm 1, that they will what? That they will perish. In this passage it says, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Think about this. We think of fire, it's more of a consuming fire that consumes up the wood or the charcoal or the oil, and it's gone after a while. This is an unquenchable fire. He says the unrepentant, he says those on the broad way will, will burn with an unquenchable fire forever and ever. And so that's one picture of this life of destruction. Those who don't repent will burn like the chaff in an unquenchable fire. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 13, this, in this passage, the king said to the attendants, Bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness. This is another picture of what this future destruction will look like. You'll be a picture of outer darkness. I mean, just being in my house most of the day has it, been hard. But imagine if it's not, it not just in your house, but it's dark all the time. It's gloomy. It's depressing. That's outer darkness. Some people live in dark places of the world, like in Alaska. It's just dark for mu much of the year. And I hear those people suffer from depression. In that place, there will also be weeping. In hell, in this destruction, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So imagine weeping for eternity. You're just weeping because you're so sad and so grieved. Over and over, just weeping away. And then you spend eternity gnashing your teeth. Okay? I have a little bit of experience gnashing my teeth a few times. I remember when I was about four years old, I didn't quite get in the car completely, and my hand was still sticking out of the door, and the door was slammed on my little hand hand, all right? And I didn't cry, I didn't even scream. I literally gnashed my teeth, because it hurt so bad. Imagine eternity of just gnashing your teeth for a very long time. Years, decades, centuries. Millenniums go by, gnashing your teeth and weeping and experiencing an eternal, unquenching, unquenchable fire. One last picture of what judgment looks like or what hell looks like. In Matthew chapter 5, 25, verse 41, this is on the day of judgment. Jesus said, will say this, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay? The cursed will go there, and the devil and his angels, into an eternal fire forever. This is a picture of eternal punishment forever and ever. I don't even know how I could picture this. I mean... Eternal fire. I mean, I put my I've put my little lips and tongue to hot coffee or hot water, and it burned my tongue. That that's hot and painful. But this is at a whole nother level uh, of pain. Um, I don't know if you, if you can imagine a torch being torched on you, and you're just burning, and you're, you experience first first degree burns, second third degree burns, and if they have like other levels of burning, you know, the hundred hundredth degree burn. I mean, you just burn really, really bad. And it's not burned like your cells now are dead. You're burning it. It's burning in such a way you just feel it forever and ever at the highest level of pain. And your pain receptors aren't being burnt out. You're just feeling it over and over and over. And so that's, that's, that's painful. That's very painful. And so this brings us to the last section, 
We looked at the two gates, the two ways, the two destinations, and now we're going to look at the two crowds. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, once again, I just want you to see this over and over. For the way is easy, it leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. Verse 14, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And for those who find it are few. Okay, so let's begin with the many, because that's presented first in verse 13, and then we'll look at the few. So these are the ones who have traveled along the wide gate on the wide on the broad way there are many in this crowd it's the popular crowd it's the crowd that six billion plus people are, are probably on today it's, it's the crowd that's loaded with people who don't know Jesus Christ personally it's the crowd that's loaded with moral people and immoral people religious people and irreligious people Jews and Gentiles, atheists, and I even believe theists. Many of those all practicing some form of human achievement of some kind, believing that their way of life would merit them a better future. I want to point you to the scariest passage in all of Scripture. Right now we're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Come with me to Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. This is a picture of people who believe that they are on the road that leads to life, that leads to the promised land, that leads to heaven one day. All indication in their mind and their thinking believe this because they, they looked at the sign and they go, this is a sign that says this is the way, this is a better life. But to this group of people, Jesus is going to say something that's going to be shocking and surprising to them. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 to 24. On that day, many, the many, remember we saw many earlier, many of the crowd, in this case, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Verse 23. Then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So these people did religious activities. In fact, they had right doctrine. They prophesied in Jesus' name. They actually had right actions. They cast out demons in his name. And they also had right practice. They did amazing practice. They, they did mighty works in God's name. So they had right doctrine, right action, and right practice. And so Jesus is possible, saying it's possible to have right doctrine, right action, right practice. But he says this one indicting statement. I never knew you. I never knew you personally. I never knew you as my adopted son or daughter. I never knew you. In, in, in fellowship. God, God is saying, Jesus is saying, I never knew you. So they had no heart. They had no relationship. And so on this basis, Jesus says, I never knew you. And, you're good. <clears throat> and this person is part, these type of people are part of the crowd of the many. I believe this will be heartbreaking and humbling. I also believe many in the church who play churchianity, who plays this game, might find themselves in this category because they're playing church and not knowing Christ. So let's contrast this with the few. Who are the few? I want you to know as we walk into this one, it's not few because the gate is narrow and the, the, the way is narrow. It's not few because... God's grace is restricted in such a way he didn't die for everyone, that the, the cross wasn't for all people, or there wasn't, there's not enough place in heaven. But it's few, because people choose not to repent of their sins, because they choose not to put the faith in Jesus Christ for, <clears throat> for salvation alone through him. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus gave encouragement. He said, 
Fear not, little flock, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants you to wants to give you His kingdom. This is His heart. This is a desire to the little flock, and He says, "Don't fear. You don't need to fear." Jesus uses the word little to describe the few here. It's from the Greek word micros, where we get our English prefix micron to refer to something small, like a microscope to look at small things. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, he says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? So in this section, in today's message, as we looked at two ways to live, you're only living one way or the other way. You only have gone through the narrow gate or the wide gate. You're either on the narrow way or the broad way. You're either headed to the destination of life or the destination of destruction. You're either part of the crowd of the few or the crowd of the many. And so, as I wrap up with one last quote from Tim Keller, I want to beg you and ask you, and really just be honest, which direction, which way represents you? And as you look at this quote, which way represents you and your direction and your path? Tim Keller says this, The path that is difficult and narrow may actually, from the outside, look the same as the other path. From the outside, it's possible that you look the same. But the path of the difficult and narrow is different. He says, but it is filled with arduous work. My friends, Christians, fellow disciples, it, it is hard work. Accept it as hard and difficult work to run the Christian life. Earlier in this passage, as I said, it's the hard way. It is a difficult way. I think sometime in America we have this entitlement mindset that it should be easier, not as hard, not as difficult. It's the hard way. It's arduous work. Tim Keller goes on and says, It is the path of deep introspection about one's heart's motive and inner character. It is a life that is not satisfied with checking off the boxes of spirituality, holiness, and piety as it ends in, in themselves, but is concerned more with the wholeness of person and purity of heart, a single-minded devoted devotion to God, a, the concern with a single-minded devotion to God that is rooted in the heart, but expressed in everything we do. This is a picture of a person who is on the right way, who's gone through the narrow door, headed to life. They understand and accept the way of the cross is hard. They're, they're willing to look at their motivation and what really drives what they do, and correct it, and ask God for mercy and grace and mourn Him in their life. And their life is truly rooted in the gospel, that they would reflect God's glory in all that they do. This is really the heart of God's people and of God's church. For those of you who have gone through the broad gate on the broad way, I want you to know and to hear this loud and clear. It's not all lost. You're not, you don't need to go to destruction as your next path in life. I want you to know without a doubt there is hope for you. For my grandparents, I prayed for them and continue to pray for uh, them. But one of them passed away trusting the Lord in her last year of life. We didn't know how we could make it to San Francisco, so we prayed that God would send missionaries. And so folks from my church I was at in San Jose would drive an hour north of San Francisco and they went to their apartment and shared Christ with my grandma. She came to Christ. How did the, these people know that they, she was my grandma? There's a picture of my family in, in my grandma's apartment in San Francisco. But she came to Christ toward the end of her life. 
Others may come to Christ in their teenage years or adult years. Some come to Christ when they're little kids, like four or five years old. But if you're on the Broadway, I want you to know that you could jump, jump bridges or jump roads simply by doing this. In John chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus says this, For this is the will of my Father. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on Jesus and believes in Him should have eternal life. And then Jesus says, I will raise Him on that day. This is an incredible verse. If you believe in the Son, if you look to the Son, you can and will and have eternal life. And Jesus promises that He, after you die physically, will raise you up spiritually on that day and take you back to that place of many houses, the Father's house, and that you would experience eternal life there forever. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's the hope that we have. And my heart to you and, and to myself, church, friends, rooted church, is basically this. Let's not waste the coronavirus, okay? I believe that God has shaken up literally the whole world for us to think of our own mortality and, and for, for the church to think through how are we to live as the church. Those who are thinking about their own mortality, or those of you who are worried and concerned about your life, I urge you to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. That you would turn right now. That you would not wait. That you would place your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. For the church, for fellow disciples, for you, I want you to think about those who are headed toward destruction and your responsibility and your calling and really your privilege to share the good news. At some point, I assume that they'll find the cure or the vaccine for the coronavirus, and then they'll manufacture it, and there'll be a mad rush to get it out to the whole world. For us, we already have the cure. We already have the vaccine to sin. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. And we should, all the more, have a mad rush to what? Share the gospel. Literally, Go through your phone and text everyone the good news. You have more time than normal, some of you. Some of you have less time, depending on your life situation and what God has for you. But those of you who have more, use this time and redeem it. Share the gospel. Do not be ashamed of the gospel that saved you and rescued you. Take on the mindset of Paul. Don't be ashamed of the gospel, for it is a, for it is a power unto what? Salvation. First to the Greek and then to the Jew. Let's pray and then we can sing and we can interact online if you like and ask questions. But please share us your prayer requests. Please share, us, share with us your desire to share the gospel to different neighbors. Or if you have personal needs, let us know and we can pray for you and come alongside you. So... Um, let's be a dynamic and interacting community in this way. We love you, and Jesus loves you, and I, remind, I want to remind you that you are loved. Let's pray, my friends. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this message. Really, it's two verse explained by your word over and over. And it is a scary verse. It is a hard-hitting passage, but we need to know this. We We can't sugarcoat the gospel. We can't exercise the easy believism or, or a watered-down gospel. We need to proclaim the truth. We need to live the truth by your grace and your power and your sovereign work in our lives. And so we pray, Lord, that you would do a work in our lives to transform it, to mold and shape it, to help us to be more like you, and that we would spread the good news, that we would engage the community around us. To this end, we pray. Church, um, you are sent. Go and reflect the gospel. If you have questions or prayer requests, please, please put them down. 
and there are four applicational and transformational questions that you guys can go through and talk about and discuss and process. I want to say don't waste this message. Digest it. I don't know where you need to run to at this point. Have lunch, microwave it, cook it up, and just digest God's Word together. We're constantly digesting food, but let's digest God's truth that we would not waste the messages that we hear. I'll stay here for a little bit. I have my iPhone if you want to ask any questions or comment or just chime in. I'm sure we can edit this later and we'll, we'll put it up for everybody. Been great to join you guys. If you have any questions? Oh, my allergies a little bit bad up here too. I thank you so much for joining in, Manny. Thanks for your help. Yeah. Sure. Fa Facebook. Thanks for technology. Can't wait till we can meet back together. We'll throw a fat party. And celebrate. Okay, thanks for the encouragement and comments. Church, uh, you're loved. We'll see you around. Text, FaceTime. Let's use this technology. I know God has made us for, for fellowship and to be with each other. So let's not isolate uh, ourselves in terms of fellowship. Um, there's one thing to social distance, but it doesn't say we don't talk to each other, relate to each other more. In fact, I think we need each other all the more. And I believe that God is doing a work now and he doesn't want us to miss out um, there are some things that are on my mind and heart right now that I want to communicate to you guys soon but I've been thinking long and hard and praying you know what's our role and what are practical ways we can engage our community and, so, and basically it's coming in the area of giving blood all of us have blood and we can give blood um, Another way I think we could give is help. There are people who are jobless and in need of food, and I think that will be an area that we're going to definitely look into. The other area I'm not sure about, but I think face, face mask and, and, and medical protection is still needed too. That might, that might be an area that we could get involved too. But those are the, probably the most practical areas I've been thinking about um, the most. And so if you have other ideas, please chime in, or if any of you want to do research online, just let us know, send us a link. We want to um, continue to serve our community, and this is not ending soon. I still think it's, it's peaking, um, it's growing exponentially, and so I, we're looking at at least another month, two months. Some people are talking about worst case scenarios going all the way to the end of the year. So I have no idea. I really don't. The only one that knows how long this will last is God. But in the meantime, help us to be faithful. Love you so much, church. We'll catch you later. Let's be moving the gospel to reflect God's glory. See you next time.